Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, is our text this morning. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. I'm reading from the King James Version. I know most of you would be familiar with the passage. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Our subject this morning is bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. Lord God, as we stand before you and before your people, whom you love with an everlasting love, I pray that you would consider our frailty and let your voice be heard. Speak through my voice, but let your voice be heard because it is your voice that makes the difference. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. I've asked the brethren on the media team just to put up a verse for me, which I believe I would like for us to read Romans chapter 2.13. This is a good verse to read before the word is declared. Would you read it with me, please? After two, one, two. For it is not, that's not, that's not most of us. Let's try again. After two, one, two. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous before God, but those who do the law will be declared righteous. So I guess everybody will hear the law today, but that won't testify that you are righteous. It is when we live out what we hear that we testify that we are righteous. What does that mean? That doesn't mean that we are saved by our doing. It means that our doing attests to the fact that we are indeed saved. Our works don't make us righteous, but our works testify that we are righteous. So just sitting and hearing the law isn't an indication that we are saved. Brothers and sisters, I would like to preface my remarks this morning with a quote from the American Reformed theologian James Montgomery Boyce. He writes, It is easy to talk about the fruit of the Spirit while doing very little about it. So Christians need to learn that it is in concrete situations rather than in emotional highs that the reality of the Holy Spirit in their lives is demonstrated. Christians need to learn that it is in concrete situations rather than in emotional highs 
that the reality of the Holy Spirit in their lives is demonstrated. So when we feel the anointing, as we say, and we have our different manifestations, that says nothing about the reality of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When we are faced with difficult situations and we allow the Word of God to be lived out in those situations, that is what testifies of the reality of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You understand that, brethren? You understand that? I'm not saying that we mustn't rejoice and worship exuberantly. I am saying that my exuberant worship says nothing about my true spirituality. Nothing at all. It is when I am faced with difficult situations, how I use the word of God that I hear on Sundays and when I read my Bible, how I use that to inform my operations. That is what testifies about the reality of the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. Bear one another's burdens. The phrase one another, one another, is one of the key phrases in the New Testament. And it ought to be a key phrase in the vocabulary of a believer. One another. Love one another. That is found several times in the New Testament. And there are quite a few more of these one another phrases. Have you come across any of them? One another. In Romans 12 and verse 5, Paul writes, So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members who belong to one another. We want to ask us, do we think about the church like that? Do you think about yourself like that? Do I think about myself like that? Do I really understand that I belong to every other member of the church? Is that how you look at yourself? We are members who belong to one another. Paul informs us here that we are members who belong to one another. As members who belong to one another, we should give serious consideration to these one another phrases because we belong to one another. So whenever we come across a one another phrase, we have to consider it very carefully so that we may ensure that we live out the reality of our one anotherness. Since we belong to one another, whenever we are exhorted anywhere in the Bible to do something to or with one another, we should consider it very carefully. Because it is only when we do it that we are living out our one anotherness. Before endeavoring to examine our text, please allow me to mention some of the other one another phrases that relate to the members of the mystical body of Christ. As members who belong to one another, we are to do the following. Let before I, I don't know how far I'll get today, you know, but, but brethren, you see, if we understand that we belong to one another, if we understand that we belong to one another, it's going to be very difficult for us to sow discord among the brethren, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As members who belong to one another, we are to do the following. Prefer one another, Romans 
prefer one another. As I read, I want you to think about your own life and how well you are doing with these. Edify one another or build up one another. Romans 14, 19. Unite with one another. <laughs> Romans 15, 5. Receive or accept one another. Romans 15, 7. Admonish one another. Romans 15, 14. Forbear with one another. Ephesians 4, 2. Submit to one another. Ephesians 5, 21. Teach one another. Colossians 3, 16. Be kind to one another. Ephesians 4, 32. Be compassionate towards one another. Ephesians 4.32 Forgive one another. Ephesians 4.32 Encourage one another. First Thessalonians 4.18 Confess our sins to one another. James 5.16 Pray for one another. James 5.16 Show hospitality to one another. First Peter 4 9. Serve or minister to one another. First Peter 4.10. One another. We belong to one another. These are the one another phrases. How well are we doing with these one another phrases? How well are we demonstrating our one anotherness? Or are we taking the gospel for what we call in Jamaica poppy show. <laughs> I am asking myself some serious questions. I'm asking myself, are you a Christian or are you a regular church goer? Do the scriptures really mean anything to you? Or can you just put them down when you are ready and live any way you want to live and Talk to people any way you want to and have a people for a period of time if you want to. Do these scriptures mean anything to you? In our text, Paul adds another one another phrase, which we will spend some time on this morning. The phrase is bear or carry one another's burdens. The believer who is filled by the Spirit consistently thinks about the other members of the body of Christ and how he or she can minister to them. That's how a Holy Spirit filled person operates. All believers are baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who places us into the body of Christ. But then Paul encourages those who are already baptized with the Holy Spirit to be filled with the Spirit. And that doesn't mean speaking in tongues again and again and again. It means being controlled by the Holy Spirit. It means being under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's how a Holy Spirit filled person operates. He or she thinks about how can I minister to the body of Christ? Not necessarily how can I receive ministry from the body of Christ? The New English translation renders Galatians 6 1 as follows Brothers and sisters, if a person is discovered in some sin, you who are spiritual, restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness. Pay close attention to yourselves so that you are not tempted to. Beloved, the apostle is clearly writing to members of the body of Christ. The Greek word translated brothers and sisters is adelphos, which literally means from the same womb. From the same womb. Paul uses the word figuratively to describe members of the Christian community. Spiritual brothers and sisters. Fellow believers in Christ. The word refers to their mutual relationship in the Lord. And therefore with each other. You see there's no way to get around it. If I say that I am in a relationship with the Lord, 
then I have to be in a relationship with everybody else who is in a relationship with the Lord. That's what it means to be in the body of Christ. This mutual relationship in the Lord and with each other provides the basis for Paul's exhortation to carry one another's burdens and how to restore a person who has fallen. So brothers and sisters, I plead with us this morning with everything that is within me to ask God to help us all to understand that as members of one body who belong to each other, when one member of the body is hurting, the entire body is hurting. In Galatians 6 1, Paul presents the hypothetical case of a believer who is suddenly tripped up and falls into sin. If a man be overtaken in a fault, the word overtaken is the translation of a Greek word which carries with it the idea of being surprised. Paul is not speaking here of a case of deliberate disobedience. He's not speaking here of presumptuous sinning. The person Paul has in mind is one who is caught off guard by a sudden overwhelming urge to sin. Has that ever happened to you? Never happened to you. It has happened to me all the time. So brother Michael, it's only you and I who are experiencing this. Let me shake your hand. So we are, we have to pray for each other. The other members here are okay. Never have had an overwhelming urge to sin. Why is the person being caught off guard? Why are we caught off guard many times? Why is it that having been caught off guard, we sin? So it's not that we are caught off guard and then we resist. We're caught off guard and we go on to sin. Why does that happen? We have to do a little hard work. Now, brethren, I'm going to ask you to pay attention and try to follow. This verse that we just read, Galatians 6.1, is closely connected to Galatians 5, the chapter before. What Paul says here must be understood in light of what he said in chapter 5. In chapter 5, Paul basically presents two methods of living the Christian life. One method is in dependence upon the Holy Spirit for the provision of both the desire and the power to consistently do the will of God. That's one method. This method results in a life in which the fruit of the Spirit is evident. It is the method of grace. The other method is that of putting oneself under law and by an attempt to obey the law by a strenuous self-effort. This method, the method of works, always results in a defeated life. It's a sincere method, you know, but it never works. And people go to churches that teach this as a method. Some of us here know about that. It always results in a life full of sin because you see the law, rules, regulations, standards cannot provide either the desire or the power to obey it. 
There's nothing in the law, in rules, in regulations and standards. There's nothing in them of themselves that provide any motivation for a person to obey them. In fact, the law uses the flesh. Listen to me carefully. The law uses the flesh or the fallen, evil, Adamic nature as a means by which to bring sin into the believer's life. Since the evil nature is a road to active rebellion by the very presence of the law. When you tell a person, do not do this, the flesh says, we're going to find a way to do it, you know. You know this. You have experienced it in your life. Paul presents the evidence of this in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. And he speaks about his own experience. I won't read it for you today. But you know about it. Or if you don't, I would encourage you to go home and read it. Read the entire chapter. Romans chapter 7. Paul talks about his own experiences as a Christian trying to live a Christian life by putting himself under law. The Galatian believers had allowed themselves to be deceived by the legalistic teaching of the Judaizers. Remember the question we are answering is, why is it that we are caught off guard? And why is it that we sin when we are caught off guard? Because we are using the wrong method of living out the Christian life. It's not necessarily that we are just careless and we want to sin, you know. We hate sin, many of us. And we hate the fact that we are caught sinning. But we are trying to solve the problem with our self-effort. That's what was happening to the Galatian believers. The, the, the Judaizers had come in and brought in their system of legalism. And so the Galatians were adopting the method of works and were finding that sin was creeping into their lives and gaining the mastery over them. They found that sin was appearing in their lives before they were aware of its presence. And at a time when they were not at all conscious of harboring any sinful desire. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe just to me and Brother Michael. They were in the same position that Paul found himself in before he understood the delivering power of the Holy Spirit. You know that you and I can have the Holy Spirit and not understand its power? It's true. It's true. Paul speaks of the struggles of this phase of his Christian life in Romans 7, 14 to 19. And I am going to read this for you. The New English Translation renders the passage as follows. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual and sold into slavery to sin. This is Paul talking as a saved man. For I don't understand what I am doing. For I do not do what I want. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I do what I don't want, I agree that the law is good. This is how we know that Paul was saved. Because only a saved person even though they are sinning, agrees that the law is good. But now it is no longer me doing it, but sin that lives in me. For I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For I want to do the good, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want. But I do the very evil 
I do not want. This passage graphically describes the exact predicament which many of us find ourselves in today because we do not have an intelligent understanding of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And it's going to take us, all of us, time to develop this understanding. As a result, we have, because we don't understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we have not adjusted ourselves to the operation of the Holy Spirit within us. And consequently, we are still depending on our own efforts to obey the commandments of the Lord Jesus outlined in the Gospels and in the epistles. We read them. And we love them. We want to do them. But we are doing them. We are trying to do them with our own self-effort. Paul learned later. He, and, and if you want to understand it, you have to read Romans chapter 8. He tells us in Romans chapter 8. Listen to me, brethren. Because we have deprived ourselves of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, even though he dwells within us, our lives are an easy prey for the devil and he's wrecking havoc among us. We find ourselves being overtaken. And, and, and I've said this before to us that, you know, what I had regarded as being spirituality some years ago, I now realize was nothing remotely close to spirituality. Brothers and sisters, it is true that some persons do go looking for sin. But this is not the case of the person of whom Paul writes in verse 1. This person, he says, was overtaken, implying that he or she was ensnared because of a failure to depend on the Holy Spirit and the means of grace. The means of grace that the Holy Spirit works through, like prayer and reading of the word and church attendance means of grace. This ought to serve as a solemn warning to all of us against legalism and against sitting in judgment on weak believers. This verse is a plea for compassion, for forbearance, for helpfulness to those who fall into sin instead of condemning and avoiding him or her we are told to restore such an one in the spirit of meekness Paul says that the person who has been overtaken in sin must be restored the word restored is the translation of the Greek word katartizo, which means to repair, to restore to a former good condition, to prepare, to fit out, to equip. It is used of the reconciling of opposing factions. It is used of the mending of nets that have been broken, and the supplying of an army with provisions. Katartizo, interestingly, was also used to describe the repairing of broken bones or the putting back into place of dislocated limbs. Restore such an one. This description of orthopedic surgery is a wonderful picture of spiritual restoration. 
Every believer who falls into sin becomes a fractured or dislocated member of the body and is in effect disabled from functioning properly in the body. It is critical in such cases that delicate spiritual restorative surgery be performed. This is not a task for butchers. Catartizo implies ongoing care and healing because a broken bone or a dislocated limb does not heal overnight. So there's fellowship Sunday. When, when the word restore, catartizo is applied to that which is weak and defective, it conveys the idea of setting right what has gone wrong or restoring that which is damaged to its former condition. Whether we are speaking about mending broken nets, setting broken bones, or restoring broken people. Church discipline should always be restorative. Church discipline should always be restorative, never vindictive. The Scottish theologian William Barclay explains that catartizo is used for executing a repair. He says that the whole atmosphere of the word emphasizes cure, not punishment. The correction is not to be thought of as a penalty, but as an amendment. Restoration is not for butchers, as I said. Who does Paul say is to be entrusted with this delicate spiritual orthopedic surgery? He says, ye which are spiritual. Paul is not speaking here of an elite set of super spiritual saints. That's not what he's talking about because this group doesn't exist. Not here anyway. He's referring to believers who are filled or controlled by the Holy Spirit. That is all Paul is talking about. Notice that Paul does not say, ye who are sinless, restore such an one. He didn't say that. He would not have said that. He could not have said that because Paul understood the scriptures and he understood the condition of a saved person. In 1 John 1, 8, the apostle John writes, if we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. If I claim, oh, I'm the pastor here, I don't commit sin, you would laugh at me. Because you know that we are all sinners. We are sinners saved by grace. If a person needed to be sinless in order to be spiritual, there would be nobody in the church to restore anyone who had fallen. Because there's no sinless person in the church. A spiritual person is a person who is sensitive to the spirit. Hear me. Listen to me carefully. A sensitive person is learning. Notice I said learning, not has learned. But is learning to live the Christian life in total dependence dependence upon the Holy Spirit for the provision of both the desire and the power to consistently do the will of God. As we noted earlier, such a method results in a life in which the fruit 
of the Spirit is evident. Spiritual persons are learning to reject the idea of attempting to obey the law by self-effort. They have tried to do so and they have failed miserably. The more they tried, the more they failed. You are looking at one such person preaching to you right now. They are understanding. A spiritual person is understanding that legalism is slavery. They are becoming increasingly aware that it is foolish after having begun their new lives in the spirit to try to become perfect by their own human effort. A spiritual person is one who is becoming acutely aware of their own sinfulness, their own proneness to wander away, their own frailty. And that awareness is making them less and less judgmental and condemnatory. When they have to deal with a brother or sister who has been overtaken in sin, they say to themselves, here go I, but for the grace of God. Brethren, can I be very honest with you that in the last few months, the Lord has been showing me my heart and it is a very ugly picture. The Lord is showing me what really resides in me and what I would be capable of if I don't lean on him even with the Holy Spirit. I am beginning to understand what incarnation really involves. It wasn't just Jesus Christ becoming a man. It was having to deal with people whose hearts are like mine. Don't look at me like Alice in Wonderland. The reason why you don't understand what is in your heart. It's because the Holy Spirit hasn't showed you yet. And whenever he does, you're going to jump out of your clothes. Hopefully you are at home when you do it. Paul understood it. He said, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's what got Paul to understanding. Ah, I can't live this way. Can't depend on circumcision. Can't depend on these rules. Because the terrible nature of my heart is not responding to these rules. I have the Holy Spirit within me who is attempting to eradicate sin from my life and to produce his fruit in my life. Lord, can you help me to start leaning on the Holy Spirit and stop telling lies when I sing I've learned how to lean and depend on Jesus. Lord, help me to really learn that. Teach me. I know it's a process, but teach me. I'm willing to learn. See, the Lord is beginning to show me that he doesn't have any special time. He's beginning to show me that every second of my life must be poured out as an offering to him. It's not just a special time. It's not just church time. 
when I am when I am working, sitting at my desk working, it is supposed to be an offering to him. I'm supposed to be working in my quote-unquote secular job as if he were my supervisor. If I am preparing a meal, I must prepare the meal as if he would be the person eating the meal. He demands every second of my time. Every moment is to be an offering. I don't have a time where I can say, Lord, I'm going to do me. If doing me means that I'm not doing you. When I do me, my doing me must give him glory. I can't switch off. And my doing me is doing something that doesn't give him glory. And then I switch back on again. The spiritual person never says to himself or herself, that could never happen to me. No spiritual person talks that way. Because the more spiritual you become, the more you see your own sinfulness. And I've demonstrated that a number of times to us with the Apostle Paul and his different self-evaluations. While the spiritual person is engaged in the ministry of restoration, he or she considers himself or herself. He or she is a Attentive to his own heart, knowing that he or she can stumble too. We don't engage in the ministry of restoration from a place of perfection. As Augustine of Hippo said, there is no sin which one person has committed that another person may not commit also. My mother would say to me as a little boy, put that into your pipe and smoke it. I won't tell you that. There is no sin which one person has committed that another person may not commit also. Today, you or I, may be restoring a person who has sinned. But tomorrow, you or I may be the one in need of restoration. An awareness of our own failures and inherent sinfulness will keep us from spiritual arrogance. We're talking about functioning in the body. Remember the members who belong to each other, not who belong to the Lord and to themselves. That's why those in the Corinthian church said, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Peter, and the worst group, the most hypocritical group, I am of Christ. If you were of Christ, you would be of Paul, Peter, Apollos, and everybody else. Hypocrites say, I am of Christ. Brother Michael, if I am of Christ, I belong to you as well. I belong to Sister Christine. I belong to Sister Penny. I belong to Brother Joseph. Brethren, I'm really talking now to people who really want to be in the church of Jesus Christ, you know. This is even beyond the Grace Workshop ministries now, you know. Restoration is to be administered in the spirit of meekness. Oh Lord, help us. Help me. The Greek word that we looked at, katartizo, which is translated restores in the present imperative.
imperative in the Greek, indicating that restoring fallen people is to be the spiritual person's habitual practice. The spiritual man was born for this. It is a practice, the restoration of fallen people is a practice which in turn necessitates continual dependence on the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because meekness is a fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5.24. Do you see why I said a spiritual person is a person who is filled by the Holy Spirit? Meekness is a fruit of the Spirit. We cannot restore people in meekness if we are not filled by the Spirit who produces meekness in us as fruit. The Greek word translated meekness describes the quality of not being overly impressed by a sense of one's own self-importance. Meekness. You know that you are not all that on a bag of chips. You know that the world is not your oyster. You know that all of us are not here to cater to you. You know that you are not the most important member of the church. If you are meek, and if you are meek, you are filled by the Spirit. Aristotle defined meekness as the quality of the man whose anger is so controlled that he is always angry at the right time and never at the wrong time. <clears throat> what a thing. It describes the man who is never angry at any personal wrong he may receive, but who is capable of righteous anger when he sees others being wrong. Meekness describes power that is very well controlled. In the New Testament, the word is always used to refer to genuine consideration for others. Meekness. We must be meek, but genuine concern. If you are genuinely concerned about me, and if I am genuinely concerned about you, we must not compromise the truth in order to appeal to the one who has been overtaken in sin. Restoration is not mod mod coddling. It's not saying, yeah man, sometimes them things happen. Go, go on. Go on. Trust God. You soon stop. No. It doesn't work that way. You have to be able to tell the person the truth. That's what we need to develop here, you know in the workshop, the ability to speak the truth in love. Brothers and sisters, it is very important for us to understand that after a person who has been overtaken in sin is restored, he or she will need not only to be helped up, but he or she will also need to be held up. Can I say that again? When I fall into sin and you restore me, it's more than just you helping me up. You have to go further and hold me up because even though I'm restored, I'm still vulnerable. At least for a while. We must recognize that the person is still vulnerable and will probably be assaulted by the tempter again who is crazily upset that this restoration has taken place. We must therefore be prepared to walk alongside the person for a period of time and sometimes even to carry them. 
This is what Paul means in verse 2 when he writes, Bear ye one another's burdens. But he, he, brethren, what did we ever think Paul meant when he said, Bear ye one another's burdens? Think it meant that you see my sister lifting up a heavy box and you go and lift it up. Take it away from her. Oh, oh. So this is, the, brethren, that's why we say Christianity is not a difficult life to live. It is an impossible life to live unless and until we are filled by the Holy Spirit. It is only then that it is possible because the Christian life is a supernatural life. Whatever burdens the brother or sister is bearing, those who are spiritual are to help him or her to carry them. While the burden could be a number of things, in context, it may well be a reference to the heavy oppressive temptation that comes on the person in an effort to cause him or her to fall again. Many of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you have experienced those types of heavy burden temptations which are so oppressive that you fell under the weight of them time and time and time again. The spiritual brother or sister has a responsibility to help the restored brother or sister to fight off these heavy burden temptations. Brothers and sisters, this kind of burden bearing, this kind of burden carrying can be very demanding. Practically, it may mean that the spiritual brother or sister be available to the restored brother or sister 24-7. But sometimes what it might come down to. It may mean establishing an accountability or discipleship structure with the individual. Bearing one another's burdens may involve this and more. Paul says, carry one another's burdens. Is that too much for us? It cannot be if God requires it. And if we are spirit-filled. Paul does not say tolerate each other or put up with each other. He says bear one another's burdens. The Greek word again translated bears in the present indicative indicating that this bearing of one another's burdens is the spiritual person's habitual practice. Ideally, ideally, every member of the assembly should put his or her shoulder under the burden which the restored member is being weighed down by. Whatever it may be, the whole church should really be involved. Because the whole church has a responsibility to be filled by the Spirit. Not just the pastor or the elders. Paul said, be filled by the Spirit. Talking to the whole church. By bearing one another's burdens, Paul says that we are fulfilling the law of Christ. What is this law of Christ which Paul refers to here? What is this, this law of Christ? No doubt he's referring to our Lord's words in John 13, 34 to 35. I give you a new commandment to love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Everyone will know by this that you are my disciples 
if you have love for one another. See the one another. One another. When we fulfill the one anotherness, we are fulfilling the law of Christ. One commentator made the following insightful remarks relative to the matter of bearing one another's burdens, and with his words, we conclude. Sin always has its consequences, its burdens. You know, that's true, brothers and sisters. When sin is forgiven, the consequences still have to be faced. So, if I go and have sex outside of wedlock, and a child results, what happens after that is not necessarily a matter of forgiveness. Perhaps my wife and my children and the church will forgive me. Not forgive me to the point where I'm going to continue up here. But forgive me to the point that I can still function in the body. But then the consequences are there. There is a child, you see? There is hurt, there is pain, there is disappointment. So don't say that the punishment is greater than you can bear. If we were big enough to do it, we should be big enough to deal with the consequences. Now so it go. Frequently, the consequences have a domino effect, meaning that problems can be multiplied and compounded almost indefinitely because of one foundational mistake. One foundational mistake. To bear the burdens of the other in this case is to get involved in the difficulties occasioned by sin. There can be no higher expression of love than Bearing one another's burdens. This is love going into action. In the second place, we are to bear with the person himself or herself. Not just the burden, but with the person. Sin is not eradicated overnight. There may well be a period of time, even a lengthy period during which the power of sin is being subdued. Since the trespass is not instantaneous, the original trespass may at intervals reappear. Therefore, to bear the burden of sin means to forbear the person who has sinned. Not that we are condoning sin in itself, but we are telling the sinner that he is not rejected either by Christ or by us. Lord, to bear one another's burdens in such a manner is not only to manifest a God-like or a Christ-like quality. It is to fulfill the law of Christ. Would you stand with me, please? I'm going to read, having ended now, I'm going to read Romans 2.13 again. For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous before God, but those who do the law will be declared righteous. Those who do the law. Brothers and sisters, see last Sunday like this now.
to call Fellowship Sunday gives us an opportunity ah, gives us an opportunity oh my uh, media team please bear with me brothers and sisters 1 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 19 near to the end could you show me that from the message please I was going to say what a fellowship Sunday like this gives us an opportunity to do and then I remembered 1 Corinthians 9 19 and how the message um, puts it you have it look at this this is Paul. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all. Why? Why are you doing that, Paul? In order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immoralists, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ. This is the phrase that I thought of, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. A fellowship day like this gives us an opportunity to enter somebody's world who might just come to you who might just come to you while you're eating and while you're sharing. This might come to you. And, and, and you might, in order to minister them to them effectively, you might have to do more than pray for them. Sometimes praying for them is just an escape. It's us saying, let me get rid of you quick. Sometimes we have to enter their world and try to see things from their point of view. Let's, let's see if we can walk softly around today and just see if there are any opportunities for us to minister to God's people. Maybe by a hug, by a smile, by just asking how are you and having the grace to wait for a response. And if the response is, I'm not doing too well, a chair is reached for. Sit down and tell me about it. <laughs>